Welcome now to Abundant Living, a series of programs designed to help us find solutions to life's problems. We feel that these solutions can be found in the Word of God and that each of us can truly have the opportunity to live an abundant life as God meant it to be. And now your host, Gary Bradley. You know, there's some questions we don't know the answer to, like when is the Lord coming back? I don't have any idea. Will it be in the year 2000, 2001? Nobody knows. He'll come back like a thief in the night. But there are some answers to the most important question in all the world, and that is, what must I do to be saved? We can give the answer to that, and that's what we're doing on Abundant Living. Thank you for joining us today. It's always a pleasure for me, to, for you to allow me to come into your home or to your hospital room, or, your, or you may be in the nursing home, you may be in a motel room somewhere, uh, you may be traveling, and you have just flipped over to Channel 19 on 930, and I'm glad you did. I'm Gary Bradley, minister of the Mayfair Church of Christ here in Huntsville. We are excited about our plans to move into our new building in a couple of weeks, and I'll be telling you more about that. I thank you for the cards and comments from last week's show for the prayer request for our prayer warriors and uh, for the additional number to our Bible correspondence course. We're so glad to offer that on a regular basis. You can study the Bible whenever you want to. We'll be glad to grade the lesson that we've given you and give you another one. And when you finish, you can have a certificate showing that you have finished the study. Let's get right into the lesson because I know there was a lot of interest from last week, some phone calls and comments, and I welcome those. I really do. I know that we're talking about a controversial subject. I read an article to you last week about how churches are struggling with the question, we know Jesus saves, but who does he save? How does he save? When does he save? And so those are the questions. And the comments I want to make before we get started is, number one, this is important for three reasons. Number one, if a person is not a Christian, he needs to be given clear, concise answers. He doesn't need to be misled. He doesn't need to be, uh, I can't imagine something this important in the mind of God being so mysterious and so obscure that a person couldn't understand it. And I think that's the reason the answer is given in the book of Acts. And that book, as I've shared with you before, is written on a sixth grade level. And so, and I've found people in working in mission work where people couldn't even read, and yet they could have somebody to read to them what God says regarding their salvation, and they can become a child of God as much as I am, and they can't read a word. And so then, it's simple, but it's not cheap. And it's not ridiculous, and it's not mysterious. And so then, for those who are not Christians, you think about a child, a grandchild, asking you, Mom, Dad, Grandma, Grandpa, what do I need to do to become a Christian? How do you start? What do you say? You know what you say. Uh, others might agree or disagree. So number one, it needs to be uh, clearly understood. Number two, we need to listen. Well, number one, we need to listen objectively to what God has said in His Word. We need to have that uh, uh, confidence to know that God will answer that question. And all I need to do is listen and that we need to study it thoroughly, that we don't need to be, uh, you know, so opinionated about something that we haven't studied. And uh, God's not going to, like in John 12, 48, Jesus said, the words that I speak, the same shall judge you in the last day. And so then the word has been given to us that may that brings it like in James 121 wherefore receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul so we need to study it thoroughly let me go back to the other listen objectively and that's just simply <clears throat> be willing to let the lord tell you the answer to the question <clears throat> uh we need to 
uh, listen to what God has said, just like uh, the um, word was given to Naaman in the Old Testament, as I illustrated last week, uh, that we need to uh, realize that God has told us what to do. God has instructed us as he instructed Naaman when he said, uh, Behold, I need to go into the river Jordan. And he, he was told to do that, and when he did, he was healed. Listen objectively. Uh, the questions asked in the book of Acts, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? In other words, uh, uh, I'm waiting here, like in Acts chapter 8, the, when the uh, F Philip joined the chariot. He said, do you understand what you're reading? He said, how can I except someone should guide me? And so then that, that's the reason. Number one, the, the question needs to be answered clearly. Listen objectively. Secondly, need to study it thoroughly. And then those of us who are Christians need to be willing to share this with other people. Share this question with our, you know, with our, our friends and neighbors because we want them saved. And so it's a vital question that needs uh, a biblical answer. Now, number three, I want us to notice this morning as we continue this life's greatest question, and that is begin correctly. Begin correctly. So many times when people come to the end of their rope emotionally and spiritually and they just kind of in desperation go and pick up the Bible off the shelf, if they haven't been taught to listen to God and they haven't studied, then they're going to open the Bible and they're going to open it blindly. They don't know where to start. And so they just, well, I'm going to read God's Word. Wonderful. And so you open it and you start reading it. You may read uh, a genealogy. You may read where Abraham begot Isaac and Isaac begot Jacob and Jacob begot the 12 sons, you know, and so forth. And uh, that may not be really what you need right then. Whereas if you know where to begin, you may read Matthew 11, Come unto me, all you that labor are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Paul told Timothy that study that show thyself approved unto God, and a workman needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing or handling aright the word of truth. When you ask the question, what one needs to do to be saved, we need to keep in mind that the Lord taught in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about the kingdom of God, and there were certain ones that came to him, and he told them certain things. Like in John chapter 3, Nicodemus, the religious leader, came to Jesus, and uh, he said, except ye be born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And he said, how can I be born again when I'm old? Can a man enter the womb of his mother a second time and be born? Jesus said, no, a man must be born of water and of the Spirit. And that, that's the way he left it. That's the way he left it. He didn't go into detail about what to do to be saved. He said, the, the two main considerations is water and Spirit. And then the woman uh, in uh, John chapter 4, the woman at the well, uh, he brought salvation to her, but there's no ex detail. He said, uh, go and sin no more. And the thief on the cross, he said uh, to him, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. There's no real explanation what these people were told. God did that through Jesus Christ because he wanted to do that because that was his ministry and that's what he was doing and he was still alive. After his death, his burial, and his resurrection, there is the carrying out of the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 18, and 19. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. They did that after the resurrected Lord in the day of the apostles as they began the church in Acts chapter 2. Now, that was a long explanation, but what I was saying was that uh, Nicodemus, the woman at the well, the thief on the cross are not examples for us today because it was done under the old law. It was done by the Lord. It was done before the resurrection of the Lord and the new will and the new covenant was preached. 
In Hebrews chapter 9 says, if you have a will, you must have the death of him that made it. So Jesus gave us a new covenant, a new will, and his death was necessary in order for it to be in force. And so a new beginning or a correct beginning should begin with the book of Acts as the Great Commission is being unfolded in Acts chapter 1. We're studying the book of Acts in our adult program at Mayfair this quarter because it's the church in action. It's the beginning of the kingdom of God. It's the beginning of the carrying out of the Great Commission. What are they doing in Acts? What the Lord told them to do in Matthew 28 and Mark 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that disbelieveth shall be condemned. So then in the book of Acts, which I hold in my hand on this page, is the beginning of the instruction from God for people to be saved. Because in the book of Acts, you have eight examples of what they were told to do and how they did it. Now, when you ask a question, you, you ask one question, you get different answers because different people are at different situations. Like, how far is it from here to Dallas? Well, it's 900 miles. Well, you get to Meridian, Mississippi. How far is it? Well, it's 700 miles. Well, you get to Vicksburg, Mississippi, how far is it? Well, it's, what, 500 miles. So I asked the same question, but they got different answers because people were at different stages. The people on Pentecost were the Jews who had crucified the Son of God, and Peter told them to repent of the vile things they've done, including crucifying Jesus, and to be baptized for remission of sins, and they shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 3,000 of them did that. And in verse 47 it says, And they were added to the church that day, those who were being saved. Folks, we need to study it thoroughly. And when you begin, when I sit down with someone and they want to know what to do to be saved, I study the book of John because chances are they don't know very much about Jesus. And after we study the book of John, that builds faith. That builds assurance in them as to who Jesus really is. And then after I've studied the life of Jesus, my natural reaction is that since he went to Calvary and he died on the cross, not for his sins but for mine, the natural question is what do I need to do to contact the blood of Christ that was shed for me that my sins might be forgiven. There's the book of Acts, the very next book. So then after we study John, then we go through the book of Acts and we look at the examples of what people did who raised the question and were given answers right then. What to do to become a child of God. So then you've got to begin correctly. Uh, if you began in the book of Daniel, you'll, you'll read a little bit about the kingdom of God, but that'll be about it. You'll read some, uh, some predictions that were made concerning the, the situation they were living in right then. If you read the book of Leviticus or the book of Numbers or Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy you're going to find out that uh, there, are certain, there are five sermons in Deuteronomy telling the children of Israel how to live. Now, why then do we have the Old Testament? Well, Romans 15 and 4 says that whatsoever things were written aforetime, long time ago, were written for our learning. We need to learn from the examples of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Joseph is a classic example for young people today. Joseph had a very difficult childhood. He was mistreated on every hand, yet he still turned out right. So those things were written uh, uh, in, in, in olden days, in the old times, were written for our learning, that through patience and, and the scriptures we might have hope. So then we must have a correct beginning. Now, when I started, I talked about the need for people to know what to do to be saved. Secondly, Christians need to know they've done the right thing. 
They need that assurance. They need that uh, uh, affirmation that, yes, I am a child of God. Look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. You are children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. And I'm so thankful for that. I am a child of God. And then in verse 27 tells me how I got there. For as many of you as were, past tense, baptized into Christ, did put on Christ. And so we're seeing, as I told you, uh, we're a number of people right now putting Jesus on in baptism. They are being saved. What about 1 Peter 3.21? Whereunto baptism doth also now not later, not not save us, but now save us. First Peter 3.21. Not the putting away the filth of the flesh is not for a bath, but an answering of a good conscience toward God. We'll deal with that more in detail in just a, uh, maybe in next week's lesson. So then we're talking about these things that are, let's go back and, and review them now before we go into the first point of the next lesson. And that is number one, we need to listen objectively. Uh, now your feelings and my feelings are important to us but they need to be based upon what God has said. You and I can be mistaken. You and I can be as honest as a day is long and still be wrong. We see this in medical fields. We see this in every other field that people think they're doing what's right and lo and behold, they find out they're doing what's wrong. And so we need to listen objectively. And by that I mean we need to listen to God and let God tell us how to feel. Nothing wrong with feelings, but it's not what we need to do to be saved. We don't go by our feelings or we'd be... Uh, obviously doing a number of things that other people are doing in the religious world or uh, in the name of religion. So our feelings and our opinions are important if they have been molded and, and uh, shaped by what God has said. So listen objectively. Number two, please study it thoroughly. Do like they did in Berea. Open the scriptures and open your heart. And when you open the scriptures and you open your heart, that's an unbeatable combination. To see if the things said were so, look at the scriptures. Back it up with the word of God. Back it up with a thus saith the Lord. And then number three, we need to begin correctly. And that's what we just talked about in this matter of moving over into the book of Acts and seeing what, when the question was raised, what kind of answer was given. Now then, if you will, open your Bibles. Do you have one? Do you, would you open to the book of Acts chapter 2 when uh, the first question was asked on the day of Pentecost when Peter got up and preached and he said, you folks uh, have sinned and you folks have crucified the Son of God and you people need to get this thing right. And they cried out, men and brethren, what should we do? And Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So then there is an example of where the question was asked and answered. Let me answer this as quickly and as clearly as I can. I know I won't get through, so we'll carry it over to next week's lesson. But let's begin with the first point, and that is we must believe the gospel. We must believe the truth. That's essential. Uh, we must believe the good news. Uh, this, this is so apparent in so many different areas, but it's especially true when it comes to this area that uh, the good news simply stated is that God has reached down to earth to save man. That's the good news of the gospel. I like 1 Corinthians chapter 15 when he talks about the gospel. Let me flip over there and read it. And if you would like, you may go with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul talks about this gospel. He said, Now, brethren, I want you to, remi re to remind you of the gospel. I preach to you which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you're saved. Now, notice two or three things there. Number one, I preach this. 
Number two, you received it. Number three, you stand in it. You're not doing, you're not wishy-washy. You're not waffling back and forth on whether it's right or not. You stand in it. And number four, it saved you. And then he describes, if you hold firmly to the word I preached unto you, otherwise you believe in vain. For what I received, I preached, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ, here it goes, died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Now that's the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. A couple of weeks ago when we talked about my class on what we believe, those are the cardinal doctrines of Christianity, uh, that, he was, that he was born of a virgin birth, that he died a vicarious death, that he had a bodily resurrection, and that he's going to return. And so when you, when you see this gospel as the good news that frees me from my guilt, it frees me from my sins, it frees me from what I have ever, anything that I've ever done, God says, I will wash it away, I will forgive it forever. And therefore, I can become a child of God and live in that relation. But it all begins with my willingness to believe the truth. I must be willing to believe the truth. You see, and it's not just a mental assent. It's just not that, yeah, I believe that Jesus uh, is the Christ. Yeah, I believe it. But it hadn't changed my life. There's a disturbing verse over in James chapter 2, verse 19. It says, the demons believe and tremble. So I'm not talking about just factual acknowledgement. I'm not just talking about reading a book and you conclude after the reading that book, yeah, you're right, he's the son of God. Has it impacted your life? Has it changed the way you live, the way you think, the decisions that you make? No. Well, it's just not that. In the Bible, the belief was put into action. You remember a few years ago when Hugo uh, came into the Atlantic uh, coastline and the people over in Charleston were told by the weathermen that the winds are 130 miles an hour and the waves are going to be 12 feet high. Suppose somebody living on the coast in their beach house said, yeah, well, they're probably right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, let's just sit on the porch and watch it come. No, that's, that's not real belief. Not, it's not, that's not Bible belief. Uh, that kind of belief, you see, would end up destroying them or that kind of, yeah, well, do you believe they're telling the truth? Yeah, we're going to sit right here and it's going to be 130 miles an hour and 12 uh, foot high waves. No, the Bible belief that Jesus wants us to have is the belief in the weathermen that causes you to load your station wagon with your kids and your animals and you get out of there. Now that's the family belief. That's the Bible belief. The Bible that has that describes our belief that moves us to action. It moves us to repent of our sins. It moves us to be baptized into Him. It moves us to take action. That's the reason, like in, in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him the kind of belief and the kind of faith that moves you to action, that causes you to respond to what the Lord has said to you. And so it's extremely important that we understand we must believe the truth. That's like in Mark 16, 6, he that believeth, just like the weather men, you get up and you do something about it. You don't just sit there and watch it come. That's when you'll end up being hurt and, and lose everything you have. And so then this matter of your response to the gospel, your response to this good news is that you believe with all of your heart. One of the sweetest things that you can do, that I do, is when somebody wants to be saved 
and I tell them about the confession that was made in Acts chapter 8. Do you believe with all of your heart that Jesus Christ is a son of the living God? And they say, I do. Well, you just think about what all is, in, what all in, is included in that, in that statement. Yes, I do believe. And uh, the, Ethiopian, the Ethiopian eunuch believed because he'd been preached to by, by, the, by Philip about the Christ. Not by, by politics or people's opinions, but he took from this very passage and preached unto him Jesus. So we're talking about the answering of the most important question in all the world. Of all the, they say a four-year-old asks 400 questions a day. <laughs> I think I know some four-year-olds that maybe push that a little bit. But the most important question anybody will ever ask is what do I need to do to be saved? And we need to be sure, number one, that we understand what that, the answer to that question really is, that we listen to God, that we uh, study it thoroughly, and we begin at the right place. And the right place is for us to believe the truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to introduce the second point, and I know my time will run out, but we'll just uh, introduce it uh, to begin with because we need to change directions. The Bible calls that repent, and that's probably the most neglected subject in all of church. Of all of our subjects and everything our people want to talk about, when we put out questionnaires and we get our classes together, you know, it's just not a very uh, very popular word now. Hey, let's study about repentance. No, everybody wants to study grace, and they want to study worship, and they want to study this and that, which is very important. I'm, all I'm saying is it is a neglected subject because it has to do with some difficult decisions. The people on Pentecost in Acts 2 were told to repent. Repent. And the Bible tells us that the definition of the word repentance is to change directions. You change directions. You were going in this direction, and God says, I want you to turn, and I want you to go in this direction. Well, as I knew, my time is out for this morning. I thank you for listening. I hope you will be back with me next Sunday because we're going to pick up right here and then move on through to the response God wants us to give. Until next week, may God bless you is our prayer. It is our sincere desire that you have enjoyed this week's edition of Abundant Living. We invite you to join us again next week at this same time. Abundant Living, a production of the Mayfair Church of Christ.